Hello students, this is Callan Bentley. Welcome back for another pre-lab video. This week in lab we're going to be using geologic maps and block diagrams to look at rock structures in Earth's interior. These are structures that form under different conditions of stress. We can classify these structures as to whether they are brittle or ductile in nature. So brittle means that the rocks are breaking, whereas ductile means the rocks are flowing instead. And if we are compressing the rocks, as in the first column here, and they're behaving in a brittle fashion, we'll end up getting reverse faulting. If, on the other hand, the rocks are weak or they are capable of flowing because they're hot or under a lot of confining pressure, then they may fold instead. Next possibility is tension, stretching of the rocks in opposite directions. If the rocks are behaving brittly, this will produce normal faults, where the upper block of rock slides down relative to the lower block. If the rocks are behaving ductily, the rocks will just stretch out, kind of like a silly putty or bread dough. The last possibility is shear, and shear is when we have lateral movement of blocks of rock parallel to the Earth's surface, neither up nor down. If the rocks are behaving brittly, that produces strike-slip faults. If the rock is behaving ductily, then we end up getting shearing in this zone here, and we'll develop special rocks called myelinites. In order to determine what sort of a structure we have, we need to be able to assess its orientation in space. And to do this, we measure two aspects of the rock's orientation, its strike and its dip. The strike is a line that is formed by the intersection of a plane of interest. So in this case, this upper orange block of rock is, say, a bedding plane. And we want to know how that bedding plane is oriented. Is it horizontal? Is it vertical? Is it somewhere in between? How is it oriented relative to the directions on a compass? Well, we can see here that on this uh, scenario, we've got north towards the back of the uh, diagram and south is towards the front of the diagram. Our block of rock is striking along the line that runs from the lower left toward the upper right. That line intersects a north-south line on a compass at an angle of 42 degrees. So basically that line is oriented 42 degrees east of north on a compass. So we would say that the strike is north 42 degrees east. Now, that given strike could have two different dips. The dip is always 90 degrees to the strike, but it's basically a question of, is it dipping off, in this case, towards the northwest, or is it dipping off toward the southeast? So in other words, the dip could be coming off the strike like that, or it could be coming off the strike like that. In this case, you can see that the dip is coming off to the right side of the strike, so that would be toward the southeast. That's the dip direction toward the southeast portion of the compass. Finally, there's the question of how steeply this rock layer is dipping. This is measured from horizontal, so if it's horizontal, this number is going to be zero. In this case, you can see that the dip angle is 30 degrees. Dip can vary between zero, or horizontal, at a minimum, and 90, or vertical, at a maximum. Last thing to mention on this diagram is the strike and dip symbol. This is basically drawn like a letter T where the long part of the T is the strike direction and the short little bar that comes off of it represents the dip direction. And we always write the dip angle on there in terms of number of degrees. You're gonna be asked to assess the strike and dip of several rock units in today's lab. And basically what you wanna do is imagine placing a compass on top of that strike and dip symbol. And then you can basically read the strike off and figure out where it intersects the edge of the compass rows and read that number of degrees off the compass. Here's another example. Just place the compass on top of that intersection between the strike and the dip directions on the strike and dip symbol, and then you'll be able to make a measurement of the strike direction. Today's lab will have you looking at example landscapes and looking at structural information, the strike and dip of the strata. In this case, we've got a series of three linear mountain ridges, and you can see that the leftmost ridge, this one right here, has uh, strata in it that are dipping at 30 degrees off towards the left side of the picture. This is also true for the ridge over on the far right. In this case, the dip is slightly different, 40 degrees, but they're still dipping off to the left. Whereas the ridge in the middle, the same strata are dipping off to the right instead at a steeper angle, 76 degrees. 
This information can be translated into a geological map. So this is a map view of this area. And then that map view can be used to create a geological block diagram, which is the geologic map on the top and then two cross-sectional views on the side. So one is sort of an oblique cross-sectional view over on the far left, and then the one that's directly facing us is a more perpendicular cross-sectional view. So you're going to be asked to make the translation this week in lab between information that you get off a geologic map and information that can be expressed in a block diagram. So for example, you've got this geologic map and you've got this block diagram and you can see that the two cross-sectional views are blank here. So you're going to be asked to add information here and complete these cross-sectional views. So for instance, on this one, you have the information that all the strata are essentially striking north and then they are dipping at 30 degrees to the east. This step has been given to you in the lab manual. You can see that uh, the strata are dipping off at 30 degrees to the east. So that angle there is 30 degrees, and you can see that on this north-south striking side over here, basically we have the strata appearing to be horizontal on that face. To complete the rest of the block diagram, you simply need to follow the same pattern, working your way into filling in each of the blank areas on the cross-sectional views. Next, you'll be asked to take a look at folds. Folds can go up in the middle, in which case we call them anticlines, or they can go down in the middle, in which case we call them synclines. They may be symmetrical, which means that the two limbs dip at equal angles in opposite directions, or they may be asymmetrical, which means that the angle of dip varies between one limb and the next, or they could even be overturned, such as in this example right here, where essentially one of the limbs of the fold has been tectonically inverted, so it's upside down relative to its original depositional position. Another thing that complicates folds a little bit is that their anatomy is sometimes in various arrangements. Let me explain what I mean. So we could define the basic anatomy of a fold as the fact that it's got a hinge line. So the hinge line represents the line of maximum curvature, maximum flexure of the folded layers. On either side of that hinge line are the limbs of the fold. In this case, we have an anticline, the limbs dip away from one another. That hinge line could be parallel to Earth's surface. In other words, like a pencil lying on the surface of a desk. Or, the examples over on the right side of the screen, you could have that horizontal surface, like the surface of the Earth or the surface of a desk, and the fold could then extend down into the Earth at some angle. In other words, the hinge line would have some angle with respect to the horizontal. And that angle is referred to as the plunge. The result of plunging folds, like this plunging anticline, is that you get a V-shaped outcrop pattern. All right, so with an anticline that's plunging, it closes in the direction of plunge, whereas a syncline would be like the opposite. It would open in the direction of plunge. Here we have an example of a syncline on the left and an anticline on the right. The point of these images is to demonstrate the fact that we have layers of different age. So basically the oldest layers on the syncline diagram are purple in color, and the youngest layers are this brown color right here in the middle of the syncline. And so the key here to recognizing a syncline then is that the younger layers are in the middle, and then the older layers are on the edges or the flanks of that fold. The opposite is true with an anticline, where the oldest layers are in the middle, and then they get younger toward the edge. Sometimes folds are not linear features, but instead sort of point features. So rather than a line representing maximum flexure, there is a single point that has moved the most. And so in this case, we've got on the left a bunch of strata that are dipping away from a central point. So that would be a structural dome that goes up in the middle. That represents a spot where a bit of the Earth's crust has moved up relative to its neighbors. On the right side of the picture, we have a spot where the Earth's crust has moved down a little bit in the middle relative to its neighbors. Again, you get this sort of bullseye pattern. But in this case, all the strata are dipping toward the middle. And the oldest strata uh, on the right example are going to be found on the edges with the youngest in the middle. And the opposite would be true over here with the structural dome. So with the structural dome, the oldest strata are in the middle, youngest on the edges. With the structural basin, the youngest strata are exposed in the middle, and the oldest strata are on the edges. 
If we add the strike and dip symbols here, you can see how the strata of the structural dome dip away from the center and the strata of the structural basin dip toward the center. Finally, we'll take a look at faults. We define faults in terms of how one block of rock on one side of the fault has moved in what direction relative to the other side of the fault. For faults that are not vertical, we use terminology that assigns the upper block the name of the hanging wall block. The lower block of rock below the fault surface is called the foot wall block. And this is terminology that goes back to mining. Often these faults, because they're breaks in the crust, they serve as conduits for fluid flow. And so you end up getting a lot of economically important ore minerals that form along a fault surface. So miners would go and they would cut into the fault itself this is not particularly dangerous. These are not tectonically active faults anymore once they've sort of been healed with a, uh, a mineral ore glue. But the miners referred to the block of rock that was above their heads as hanging above their heads, so the hanging wall block, and then their feet were walking on the foot wall block. Now, if the hanging wall block has moved down relative to the foot wall block, that's called a normal fault. If the hanging wall block has moved up relative to the foot wall block, that is the opposite of normal. It's called reverse, all right? So the reverse of normal. And that's basically where you have tectonic compression putting in the energy to shove that hanging wall block up against the pull of gravity into an upward position relative to the foot wall block. Let's take a look at this example here. Here you have a fold, a very tight fold, in fact, something that formed due to ductile deformation that is then faulted uh, at some point after it originally formed ductally, then later the rocks cooled off and they were stressed again, and this time they broke. What kind of faults are we looking at here? Well, if this is a vertical outcrop of rock, then the hanging wall has moved down relative to the foot wall on each of these three faults. On the other hand, if we're looking at a pavement outcrop, in other words, if our perspective is a, a map view perspective, then we're looking at perhaps vertical faults and the right side is moving to the right relative to the left side of the fault. With strike slip faults, we say that if the other side of the fault looks like it's moving to our right, then we call that a right lateral fault. No matter which side we're standing on, that holds true. If it's a left lateral fault, the sense of offset will be reversed. Well, I think that's all about all you need to know in order to get started on this week's lab. Good luck interpreting the structures hidden in the earth deep under your feet. See you next week for another pre-lab video.